There we go. Tonight we want to look at Romans chapter 2, and I want to do to go into Romans chapter 3. Obviously, uh, if we're going to go into more detail, we can't cover that much ground. Uh, I've got to tell you that uh, as interesting as Romans 1 is and, and was in our studies, Romans 2 is intensely interesting because it delves into the actual makeup of the human soul. And, uh, and that's only the sidelight. The main part of it has to do with the justice of God, and that is where we're going to center our attention, and that is on the justice of God. So at this time, uh, let's take a few moments for silent prayer and ask uh, the Lord to bless our time together so that we can uh, reap a great benefit. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we are thankful to you that you have given to us this time to gather together. We recognize more than ever how much we need your word, because without your word, we are nothing. The only thing we can ever take with us from this life is your word, and we pray, Father, that we would invest our time wisely so that we could present to you a heart of wisdom. And so, Father, we ask now that as we go into our study in the book of Romans, that you would uh, open our hearts to the truth, that we might be uh, more endeared to you as a person, and that we would be able to see the wonders uh, and the immensity of your attributes. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you would turn your Bibles, well, uh, let's do a little review of chapter 1. And cha In chapter 1, we have the description of the immoral man. And in parentheses, you'll see on the screen that I have the Greek. And uh, you'll recall when we first introduced this whole subject matter that uh, I was telling you that the division of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 is just a broad stroke division. When you get into more precise detail, it's Romans chapter 1, and then it's Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, then verses 17 of chapter 2 through 29, and then you begin with chapter 3, and so you have the immoral man in chapter 1, you have the moral man, or the moralistic man in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, you have the religious moral man in verses 17 through 29. And then in chapter 3, then you have the Jewish religious man. And so uh, it's kind of like we throw in an extra uh, guy in there, an extra character, but, um, but we don't. Chapter 2 deals primarily with what is known as the justice of God and the judgment of God. And so... Uh, when we think of the justice of God, we are actually looking at the one attribute that becomes the interface between God and man. Unless this attribute is exercised by the Lord, there cannot be any type of communication between God and man. The barrier cannot be surmounted. Oftentimes we think that our salvation is based on love, but our salvation is not based on love. It could never be based on love. If it's based on love, then we would lose our salvation almost immediately because as the targets of God's love, we would be found completely inadequate and unworthy of His love, and He would have to dump us. Instead, our salvation is based on the justice of God. And what this means is that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and injustice paid the penalty for your sin and mine so that there is an imputed righteousness given to us so that when God looks at us, He always sees us in the same purity in which He sees the Son, and our salvation holds, and it holds, and it holds, and it holds. And, uh, and so when we sing the song, which I so much love, O love that will not let me go, well, this is true, but it's the justice of God that actually makes it work. Okay, reviewing chapter 1 once again. In chapter 1, we have the concept of the immoral man. And uh, we find that there are basically three avenues or three ways in which there is a line of communication between God and man. And maybe line of communication is not the correct term. Uh, the correct term would be... Uh, a fountain of knowledge concerning God. 
In other words, this is a fountain from which man can, uh, with his hand, lap up a little bit of water and put it to his mouth and find something about God. And those uh, three uh, methods are, first of all, uh, nature. And uh, you can look out the nature, you know, the babbling brook, the stars in our universe, uh, the, the wonderful constellations, and you can say, of course, there's a God, you know. Uh, like, uh, oh Lord my God, you know, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. That's nature. And that is actually the first section of Psalm 19, which is one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 19, which talks about the nature of God and how man is able to find a few things out about God. The second uh, fountain from which man can uh, lap a drink and find out about God is his own conscience, or should we say it's the image of God in which he was made. Somewhere along the line, despite the fact that there was the fall of man which made him totally depraved, there is a consciousness of God. Now this doesn't mean that he has a hunger for God, it doesn't mean that he has an affinity toward God. What it means is that he knows that God is, exists. And what's more is that God is a judge and that somewhere along the line he is going to exact judgment so that man will be subject to the judgment of God. And so the doctrine of the total depravity of man is not unraveled, it is still intact, and uh, I know that we as preachers, sometimes we have a tendency to overstate our position, and to say that, uh, well, in the past, uh, we've always believed that there is no communication between God and man, but we know that it, with further Bible study, that there is something within the soul of man. Well, yeah, but that doesn't tell us that man is seeking after God. And Romans chapter 3 tells us that there is none that seek after God. There is none that does righteous, righteousness. And so we cannot come up with a theological um, creed or a theological statement that contradicts the Bible. Because when you compare the two, you will have to make a decision. Which one are you going to go with? And if you go with the conclusion that you've come to, then you're just as bad off as many of the charismatics who will evaluate and compare their experience to what the Bible says. And they choose constantly for their experience. If you choose constantly for your theological thesis, then you are going to depart from the meaning of the scripture and you'll never really know. And so this is the tight uh, rope that we need to walk, and that is that we have to follow what the scripture says and even when we don't understand, we have to depend that God will make it clear to us by and by. So, in chapter 1, we find that no matter how immoral man may be, that uh, there is something within him that tells him that God is going to judge him. And so we have these three avenues once again. We have the uh, realm of nature. We have the... Uh, enter or the inner part of man, which tells him that God is a judge and going to uh, call him to justice someday. And then the third thing that we have is the scriptures. And the scriptures is what gives us our total understanding of God because it goes into the depth. So, what is it that the immoral man does? The immoral man takes the truth that he gathers from nature and the truth that he gathers from his own inner being and he suppresses that truth. He suppresses that truth with acts and theories of immorality. And in his suppression, what he does is that he makes the truth not to have the proper amount of value that it should have and instead he raises the value of his own theories or his own experience. Some examples of this has to do, for instance, with the subject of uh, that's going on right now in our country. Uh, the president uh, today uh, has uh, taken a an executive or has made an executive order in which.
which he uh, is altering the Second Amendment and he is making a much stricter uh, law structure as far as guns are concerned in our country. And then he comes out by arguing or giving the rationale for it by saying we are the uh, only advanced country that has such a violent outbreaks that uh, <laughs> take place with uh, firearms. And um, his idea is that if we are able to make guns more difficult to be obtained, that there is going to be less and less uh, of this crime. Well, that is a theory on his part, and it is completely contrary to the facts. Uh, there are counties and cities in our own nation that have the most stringent and strict firearm regulations, and uh, they are the two foremost uh, regions that have firearm violence. And it isn't because the people who live there uh, haven't registered their guns. It's because the criminals haven't registered their guns. The criminals don't follow the law. And so uh, the more and more this is spouted by uh, the present administration and those who follow this, this administration, the more they're going to believe that it is our society that can quiet down the old sin nature of man and that man will stop killing another man just simply because you take away the weapon that's in his hand. And so the logical question that any thinking person would ask himself is, well, how did people kill other people before firearms? Obviously, there must not have been a whole lot of killing then. Well, we know that that's not true. It doesn't stand uh, to the ordinary test of time and the test of reality. And so the immoral man takes his immoral acts and the more that he proclaims them, the more that he is proud of them, like in the gay pride parade, the more that he's going to say, see, this is normal. This is what normality is, or normalcy is. And by doing that, it's kind of like we are going to take the popularity contest, and because the majority thinks that this is right, then the laws of God are trumped, and they don't, no longer have any... Um, influence over me and this idea that I have in my innermost being that there is a God and that this God is going to require me to come to judgment can be thrown out because the majority of the people don't believe that this is sin. And that is what is meant by suppression. And so the immoral Greek uh, was completely immoral. He, his uh, life uh, was completely different than anything that we know today. And it is only those particular cultures and nation, nations that came in contact with Israel, and later on, of course, with the Christian ethic, that they changed their morality, and the morality that we know today is the product of the uh, Judeo-Christian ethic. And so we need to understand that and that is what tells us about Romans chapter 1 and how the immoral man feels that he can bypass the judgment of God because of a popular appeal or a popular majority. So now we're ready to go to chapter 2. And so let me read the first verse because this is very telling. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, begins with the word, Therefore... You have no excuse. And so, we have to say, you know, why does he say therefore? And the idea that you have here is that everybody can tell that the people described in chapter 1 are definitely going to come under the judgment of God. But we come to chapter 2 and says, therefore, you have no excuse. And then it says, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you judge, uh, or it should be you, for you who 
judge, uh, practice the same things yourself. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, the Apostle Paul changes or turns the tables. And he says, those of you who are not Greek, who look down your nose upon the Greeks, the immoral people, and you look down your nose upon them, you are just as guilty as they are. So, we need to back our thinking uh, a little bit, or put it in reverse a little bit, by recognizing that now the Apostle Paul is talking about the justice of God. Because he is rejecting the justice of man. He says, you are without excuse. And so, the idea that Paul proposes for us here to understand is that the justice of God is the gold standard for judging other people. And the justice of God is completely inflexible. It is perfect, and it is uh, holy, and it is the one attribute that allows God to have a relationship with man. Okay, now there are ten attributes that we usually uh, take into consideration as being the attributes of God. We say, number one, that God is sovereign. Two, that God is righteous. Three, that God is just. Four, that God is love. Five, that God is eternal life. And then there are three others that begin with omni. There's his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. And then there's an immutability and veracity. So you have ten attributes that deal uh, with God. In other words, uh, God is every one of these all together. And the one that I want to call your attention to is that uh, third one, and that is that God is just. And I want to call your attention to that because this particular attribute is the one that allows God to have a relationship with man. The justice of God is, as it were, the watchdog over the other attributes of God. For instance, if God were to do an act, and if it weren't perfectly right, then the justice of God would say that isn't right, and it would reject that act. So that the justice of God is like the watchdog. It is the vigilant individual who keeps track to make sure that everything that God does, if God does something with his power, it is completely powerful, can never be reversed. If God does something with his love, it is complete love, and it could never be reversed, because the justice of God keeps it straight. So here is where we start to make this contact with God, or God makes contact with us. How could he have contact with me since I am a filthy sinner? I am unworthy, unclean, as the song says. How can that be? Well, the answer is that somewhere along the line, the justice of God has got to be placated by me so that God can do this. The extension of this is that now that I'm a believer in Christ, how do I expect to be blessed by God? Well, guess what? He doesn't bless you because He loves you. He blesses you because you meet His righteousness and His justice gives it an okay. If His justice does not okay whatever blessing is coming your way, you're not going to get it. So, here's a person who gets saved, starts going to a church, and when he's at church, uh, the preacher or somebody says, well, you know, you've got to give 10%. You have to pay your tithe. And so he doesn't pay his tithe, and he doesn't pay his tithe. Then uh, one of the church members there, uh, maybe he's a businessman, gives a testimony about how he was down and out at one point, and, and one day he decided that he was going to start giving a tithe to the Lord. And from that day on, that God blessed him. That is a full-blown lie. God never blesses you for the righteousness that you produce. He blesses you for His justice, not for yours. When a person says, God bless me because I paid a tithe, he falls into the category that is found in Romans chapter 2. 
He is now judging somebody else. He said, if you do the same, God's going to bless you. And if God doesn't bless you, you must not be doing something right. That's and so true. Now, now he's pointing to himself and saying, I am righteous. It's Job's friends. And they were self-righteous. And that is what is found in chapter 2. Every person who judges another is actually elevating himself and taking the place of God. And as an interloper, uh, he then moves God aside and he puts himself in the place of God. So, usually when a Christian or a believer has been schooled a little bit, uh, he will come up with such things as, well, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. And uh, that means don't ever say anything to me because I don't want to be criticized by you. And so here you have the usage of this little gimmick that if you, if you say that, then you are going to take the place of God. But this is what I submit to you. At the Bible, in the context of the Bible, and the Bible doesn't say that you should not be able to discriminate. What the Bible actually means is that you should not condemn somebody for some, something that they're doing. Something that you do, too. But, well, it could be something yeah. that you do. But, for instance, let's say that I say, well, you drink coffee. Yeah. We say, well, you're judging. No, that is just a fact. You drink coffee. Well, what happens to your body, that's something else. But all I'm saying is that you drink coffee. See? And God doesn't ask you to put your brains on hold just because you become a Christian. He asks you to be wise in the things that you, uh, that you decide. When you are parents then you judge what your children do. And you better, because it's your responsibility. You are responsible for raising your kids. And so when you tell them, you were lying to me, if your kid says, oh, you shouldn't judge me, they're absolutely wrong. They should get an extra whack, if, if wax is what you're giving them. Because they're just being smarty, smarty pants, and there is no real reason in that. A parent has a right to judge his children. Why? Because a parent has been given authority over his children. And every person who has been given authority has the right to judge. You're the boss at, your, at where you work. And uh, somebody is stealing something. You catch them stealing. You say, you're stealing, you're fired. You say, well, you're judging me. You're right, exactly. But you have authority to do that. When God gives authority, He gives authority. And so, that is a caveat to the judgment that is here. The judgment that is here is the judgment where you malign someone, you attempt to assassinate the character of someone because of your pride. Not because of the authority that has been vested in you. If you are a cop and you are reading your radar gun and a guy is speeding, you stop him for speeding. You're not judging him. You're merely giving him the citation. The judge is going to judge him. But the judge has been given the authority to judge. And so there is a proper place for judging and there is an improper place for judging. When you are judging improperly, you are elevating yourself to a place of God and taking His place. Okay, so chapter 2 begins like that. Verse 2 says, And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And so in verse 2, it reinforces what I just said. We know, that's a judgment, that the judgment of God rightly falls. In other words, it is correct, God is correct in letting his, his judgment fall on those people who practice such things. Okay, so now we're talking about the justice of God. 
In our minds, when we think of justice, we always have a tendency, especially in the English language, to make a distinction between being right and being just. In the minds of the Greeks and in the minds of the ancient world, being right and being just was basically the same thing. So that when you were right, you were also being just. If you were being just, then you were being right. Now we kind of divide this a little bit for our mentality purposes. Because our minds uh, are able to distinguish between those things. But in the mind of the ancient Greek, that was the same. So almost every place in chapter 2 where you say, where you see the, the phrase, the righteousness of God, it really should be translated the justice of God. And this is important because it's the justice of God that sent Christ to the cross. It's the justice of God that gives you salvation. It's the justice of God that keeps you from losing your salvation. And so that is the outcome as far as uh, chapter 2 is concerned. Let me switch the slide here. The moral man, his description, uh, and his use of the truth. His description is that he is a continual critic. He is constantly criticizing someone. He is the, the famous or the infamous holier than thou. He's the guy that looks down his nose on somebody else. He produces a false front and a uh, panoply of mental attitude sins, not overt ones. In other words, most of his sins are in his mind, so you can't see them. His sins are more dastardly because they are invisible. So it's kind of like when you have a tooth that uh, is starting to decay. It has a cavity. You can't see it. You can't feel it until it's too late. By the time you go see the dentist, your tooth hurts, and they're going to have to pull it out or do something dread, dreadful like that. That is the way mental attitude sins are. You don't know until it's too late. And you don't know until it's too late, particularly the person, the moral or moralistic person of chapter 2, because the moralistic person lives in a bubble that is filled with himself. And in this bubble... He evaluates everything according to himself. He is the measuring rod. He is the standard. So, what this does is that it makes that person, for one, it makes that person unteachable. It makes that person uh, resistant to authority. Because in authority, you have someone outside of you telling you what to do. But this person will not, because there's something inside of him that says, no, I won't. What is that something inside of him? It's his own arrogance, it's his own pride, and that's because he is a moralistic person. So, almost always, in fundamentalist churches, you have people who are plagued with being moralistic. And I would imagine that the majority of those people really aren't even saved. They don't understand grace. They think that they're saved because they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't play cards, they don't go to movies, they don't dance, they don't chew, they don't do this or they don't do the other. And so this particular moralistic person is deluded. We see this in verse 3 where it says this, But do you suppose this, O oh man? Do you suppose, in other words, is this what's going on in your mental practices? That when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and you yourself do the same, that you will escape the justice of God? So here is a person who is protecting himself with the shell. And uh, he has such high esteem that he looks down his nose on everybody else and he doesn't recognize that there's an authority greater than himself that is going to judge him. And so, just like the immoral man suppresses the truth with the things that he does, the moralistic man suppresses the truth with the things that he thinks. And so our second column here is that he downgrades the truth of God, he downgrades the riches of the kindness of God, 
he, the uh, common grace of God, the saving grace of God, the riches of God's forbearance, the riches of God's patience, and uh, these people do not obey the truth because they cannot obey something that is outside themselves. Their old sin nature just simply won't let them. And so this is that person, this is that moralistic person. If you look at these verses, <clears throat> beginning at verse 4, it says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness? This is the downgrading, this is the devaluating of the riches of the kindness of God. So what are the riches of his kindness? Those are all the things that God produces for the just and the unjust. The rains fall on the just and the unjust. doesn't matter whether they're believers or unbelievers. God blesses this earth so that the human race can propagate and, uh, and continue to exist. And so when he downgrades the, rich, the kindness of uh, God, he is saying that God has nothing for him. That he is his own man. He is self uh, made and uh, his success he owes to his hard work. He owes to his honesty. He owes to his work ethic. He owes to, to his talent. And so he's in that circle or in that sphere where nothing penetrates from the outside. Everything is measured uh, by himself. He also downgrades the riches of the forbearance of God. And the forbearance of God is that God the Father, in eternity past, decided that from the time of the cross to the year 2016, that he was not going to count the sins of anybody until after the person died. Not going to hold them against them because Christ went to the cross. And the rejection of Christ, which is the sin which is being for, foreborn, is what is being withheld. There is, so long as a person's alive, he has the choice or he has the opportunity to believe in Christ. And so, <clears throat> when a moralistic person uh, downgrades the forbearance of God, he is basically saying, I'll live my life, and when it's time to die, I'll just lay down and die. Because he doesn't think that there is someone outside of his little bubble that can um, come either to his rescue or who will actually judge him and then rescue him. And then thirdly, you'll notice that he also downgrades the riches of the patience of God as far as judgment is concerned. And um, that uh, goes along with the same thing that I have been saying. Now, number four, if you'll notice on the column, it says they do not obey the truth. In verse 8, it says, But to those who are selfishly ambitious and who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There's a whole lot more that I could say here because this gets involved here in verse 7 and 8. But in verse 8, they do not obey the truth. I guess the easy way to understand this phrase is that the, the scripture says that if a person is going to be saved, he needs to believe in Christ and he will be saved. So the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, that's a command. There's only two things you can do with a command. You can either obey it or disobey it. And that's why you have the word obey here. This is the truth. So that if you are suppressing the truth, it means that it's out there and you're rejecting it. You're building a barrier, a wall, so that the truth does not penetrate. And so this is the way in which you uh, use the truth or how you suppress the truth. The method that these people use for salvation is their own personal good deeds. And they'll say that their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds. The results are, number one, that they are without excuse. God does not excuse somebody because of their good deeds. And then second, that they are storing up wrath for themselves because when God is forbearing uh, what Christ did on the cross and uh, 
uh, forbearing that rescue, and uh, then he's also <coughs> forbearing the judgment that is to come. And so it's like a bank account. You keep adding interest to it, and you will get uh, wrath uh, for yourself. And so this is the picture of that moral man. Beginning, uh, well, I guess I need to read verse 12 because we, um, we are now going to make a transition into the Jewish moralistic man. And so verse 12 begins with that by saying this, For all who have sinned, without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So, we are looking at here not how a person is going to be saved, but the basis for the judgment of God. How is it that God judges a person saved or unsaved? And so, in the first case, we have all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. In other words, the Ten Commandments are not going to have any part in His condemnation. Now, we like to use the Ten Commandments in order to show a person that they're sinners. But God doesn't need the Ten Commandments to show them that they're sinners. He can actually say to them, you looked at the universe, and you had to say to yourself, some intelligent form made this, but you rejected that. You said, like it says in Proverbs, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that the word for fool means to be actually insane or slight, you know, to be off your rocker. Only a fool would say that. Because when you look at this intelligent design, it is intelligent. And I don't know if I've told you this before, but I, I've been in tons of trials in court. And... Uh, a prosecutor, a lady prosecutor who is now a judge in Mason County, a Superior Court judge, always used to address the jury by telling the jury, you know, I like to make cookies. And I have daughters, and they will sneak into the kitchen, and they will take the cookies off the cookie sheet after they come out of the oven. And so I know that I put out 24 cookies on the cookie sheet, and when I turn my back and I come back to now, she didn't see anybody take them. But the circum her daughters come and they've got cookie crumbs around their lips. She says, I know who did it. It's the same way when we look at the universe. We look at the universe and we know that it didn't just happen by itself. It's as ridiculous to think that the universe just happened as thinking that somebody took uh, you know, a box of alphabets and uh, went out to the beach and threw them up into the air and they came out as... Uh, is one of Shakespeare's sonnets, or a page from a dictionary. It's impossible to believe that all those letters would get arranged like that by the wind. And you say, some intelligent force did this. Well, we reply, nobody would actually be so foolish as to think that. But if you go out on a hike, and as you're going on a hike, you find five stones that have flat surfaces, and they are stacked one on top of the other, what do you think? Somebody put them there because they're marking out a spot for somebody else. They didn't write out a note and tack it onto a tree and say, you know, turn here. They put five stones, flat surface to flat surface, and stacked up a little tower. A human being had to do that. I know it wasn't a bear. I know it wasn't a coyote. I know it, that it wasn't an earthquake. Somebody with intelligence had to do that. And so that is the way that this man is looked at. He is without excuse. So when we come now to the, the religious Jew, uh, he says, now there are those who, who uh, have sinned under the law, they're going to be judged by the law. And so what does that mean? It means that if you just happen to be Jewish. And since you happen to be Jewish, you were introduced to the law of God and you still rejected it, you're just as lost as the immoral person. So, verse 13, For it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, 
but the doers of the law will be found justified. And so in verse 13, we are told that it's not just the people who have heard the law. So just because you're Jewish and you've had the law taught to you as a child and as an adult, you hear it whenever you go to the temple. It's not just the hearers, but it's the people who actually perform the law. Can you perform the law? The answer is no, you can't. We know that. Ten commandments that cannot be uh, successfully executed by anyone. And so that's why God presented shadow Christology. So verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, there is not uh, these not having the law are a law unto themselves. And so in verse 14 it says that even if they do not comply with the Ten Commandments, they still have something within them that tells them God is going to judge me. So, what does that mean to us, or what if, what application can we attach to that um, for us uh, when we are witnessing? When we are witnessing, what this means is that you don't have to try to convince them intellectually that the Bible is true or that the Bible uh, uh, is uh, giving the right information for salvation. You don't have to do that. Most, or I shouldn't even say most, all negative volition is not based on intellect. It's based on emotional or, or gut reaction. I do not want to be told from the outside. And this is a self-righteous person. So when you tell that person, look, you need to believe in Christ as your personal Savior, you've done your job. And if the person starts giving you something, you say, you know that I'm right. You know way down in your heart of hearts that I'm right. And they'll have to say to themselves when they are by themselves that you are right. And the Holy Spirit can then begin to move with them. If you start giving them arguments about this and that, and then uh, they'll start to think of some, some way to refute your argument rather than to deal with the issue of Christ. Okay, verse 15. And that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And verse 15, it speaks about that law that's within them that either accuses them of being a sinner or that defends them from not being a sinner. And that is self-righteousness. Verse 16, On the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. And so there will come that day when God will judge them. And once again, this is the justice of God. Verse 17 begins with a new section. And it shows about uh, the religious Jew. The religious Jew is a Jew who is moralistic. And so it goes like this. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the abundant or the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that uh, one shall not steal, do you steal? And then it continues. And so the address here is now to that moralistic Jew who says, well, I've had the law. I even am a Sunday school teacher. But the question is, you who preach don't say the question comes back to him. Do you steal or not? And it's his conscience that is going to tell him. And of course the law says, thou shalt not steal. So he will be convicted. Verse uh, 22. You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols... Do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Verse 24. 
For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. And then there, uh, the uh, that's the uh, uh, you might say it's the footnote for the uh, quotation that has just been given. And the idea that you have here is that the Jews or the Israel as a nation was designed by God to be the light of the world so that the world would come to know Christ. The people would come to Jerusalem and that's how they would get information about the gospel. They would get information from the various teachers and they would teach them the law and so on and so forth. And Israel was a nation that was unique compared to all the nations of the ancient world because the ancient world, yeah, they had laws, but basically the law for them was if they don't catch you, it's okay. And it's and the they was the person who is the king or, or, or the emperor, but not for the Jews. The Jews said that God is the one who does all of this and that each individual had to uh, represent uh, himself or present himself to God for judgment. And so this was a really high standard. And so when the Jews would teach Gentiles who would come to Jerusalem, or when the, the older generation would teach the younger generation, they were being hypocritical because they themselves were also doing the same things. Verse 25 for indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. <clears throat> In this whole chapter, the Apostle Paul is following a string of logic. And in this case, he's using the example of circumcision. And he says, if you have circumcision and you obey the law, then the circumcision has some value for you. But if you don't, then you might just as well never have been circumcised. And so to us that doesn't mean a whole lot, but to the Jew, being a Jew and following the law meant that God had a promise set out for you in the future, and it was his assurance of salvation. But if you were circumcised, but you betrayed or you did not follow the law, then just because you're circumcised didn't mean that you were saved. And so this is what the Apostle Paul is telling them. And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? And so in this verse he says, let's turn the tables around. And let's say that there is a Gentile, but that individual keeps the law. Won't he judge you? The answer is, of course he will. Because if he can do it, why can't you? Verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is uh, circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. And so once again, he brings us all the way down to what the justice of God is. What justice these individuals have, whether they're moralistic uh, Romans or moralistic Jews, is self-righteousness, which is relative righteousness. I'm better than he because I'm circumcised. That's relative righteousness. And Paul says, you have to get that idea out of your head because the only righteousness or the only justice that holds any water is the justice of God. Okay, then we come to chapter 3. And here we come to the religious Jew. Uh, <clears throat> and the description of him is that he is a guide to the blind, and we've seen this in, in chapter 2. He's a corrector of the foolish, he's a thief, he's an adulterer, he's an idolater, and as a result, he brings shame to God. How does he use the truth? He doesn't apply the truth to himself. So in verse 21 of chapter 2, it says, You who teach another, do you not teach yourself? So he doesn't utilize the truth for himself. 
He relies on the law of salvation, uh, or the, on the law for salvation, and this is the way in which he would uh, want to be saved. And since the objective of the law is actually to show the sinnerhood of man, he who utilizes the law only shows himself to be a sinner, so that circumcision becomes uncircumcision, what we just read uh, a few months ago. The result is that his praise is from man and not from God. And the opposite is the opposite of praise is actually wrath. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at verse 3, the Apostle Paul asks a question. Now, oftentimes in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he presents a scenario as if he were in a classroom and a student was asking him a question. But he's not in a classroom, so it has to exist in the mind of the reader. And the way that he does it is that he asks the question himself. So it's a rhetorical question. Nobody in the audience has to answer the question. It is a question that he's asking to provoke the thinking of the audience. So the question is, then what advantage has the Jew? So, if the immoral man is condemned by God, if the moralistic Gentile is uh, condemned by God, if the moralistic Jew is convicted and uh, condemned by God, then what benefit is it to be a Jew? What benefit is there to have the law? And so we would say, well, there is no advantage. But the Apostle Paul does exactly 180 degrees on this one. He says... <clears throat> in verse uh, 2, great in every respect. So being a Jew gives that person a great deal of advantage. And then he begins with these advantages. Uh, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What does that mean? It means that the nation of Israel was the nation that God selected to have the scriptures written and to be put in a library catalog. Now today, the church age has taken that position. The, the church has become the uh, guardians of the text of Scripture. It's not the universities, it's not anybody else except the church. Nobody else will take on that task, and nobody else is worthy. Nobody really wants it. And so one of the advantages is that Israel had the law given to them and through them. Verse 3, what then if some did not believe? Their unbelief did not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? And so in this next verse, it's kind of like, okay, so God gave us Israel, the Old Testament. He gave us the scriptures. In the scriptures, the Messiah is revealed who's the way of salvation. But what if I don't believe that there is a Messiah? What if I don't believe what God says in his word? Does that make God a liar? And so that is, it's, it's a logical question. And by that I mean that the Apostle Paul asked this question to prompt them to think along a certain lane. And that lane is that salvation or the justice of God. And so... We are, I want to introduce you now to this phrase, adjusting to the justice of God. Every person who is an unbeliever needs to be adjusted to the justice of God. That means that before God can save you, God in His grace provides the mechanism, and that mechanism is by believing in Christ. That mechanism is going to be explained in chapter 4. In chapter 4, Two personages from the Old Testament will be introduced. One will be Abraham, the other one will be David. And Abraham, or it's not going to work. You're not going to be adjusted to the justice of God. So God cannot bless you with salvation unless you believe. Because if you don't believe, you're not going to have the perfect righteousness of God. And before God can bless anything you do, you have to be adjusted to the justice of God. So, at the beginning of every one of our Bible classes, 
We have a basic adjustments that the person that a person has to do as a believer, or as a as a as a person who's going to be saved. The first adjustment is believe in Christ as your personal Savior. That puts you into the path of blessing. The first blessing you receive is eternal life. The second area of adjustment is the confession of sin. Every time that you sin, you confess your sin. Why is confession so important? Because you don't have to feel sorry for your sin. You just have to name or cite your sin. When you name and cite your sin, you are adjusting to the justice of God because you're saying, my Lord Jesus Christ paid for this sin on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when you say that, you are basically saying, it doesn't matter how I feel about my sin. Maybe I enjoyed my sin, or maybe I have terrible regrets about my sin. But neither of those emotions have any impact on the removal of those sins from my account. Only the work of Christ on the cross does. And so, this is an understanding of grace. If you don't understand uh, this aspect of grace, you are not going to grow in a Christian life. And this is one of the reasons that so many people in these so-called fundamentalist churches, they never grow. They never grow because they do not understand grace. And they may have great campaigns, they may have great programs for children, they may have great uh, uh, doctrinal statements, but if they do not understand grace, and if they can't make the congregation or the people of the congregation to understand grace, those people are not going to grow. They can't. It is impossible for them to grow because the justice of God must be satisfied. And if you can't satisfy the justice of God, you cannot be blessed. Okay, so I've made a really wide statement here. And so I need to back it up and tailor it with a pair of scissors. So, I get up in the morning, I'm able to breathe, take my shower, all, we can go back. To, and, if we're downgrading the, the riches of His kindness, as believers, then we're just as bad as unbelievers. See? And so, we need to understand that even when our sins are not confessed, that God still blesses us, because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And this falls into the larger topic of the love of God. Remember earlier I said, you know, the love of God doesn't save us. The love of God doesn't keep us saved. It's the justice of God. The love of God is probably the most difficult subject in the Bible to grasp. There are... I can't remember how many mentions of the love of God in the Bible, but every one of them, minus one, is the mention of an anthropopathism. In other words, it is a word that God uses of reference. And so, when it says that God so loved the world, he's using an anthropopathism. And that anthropopathism is the policy of God. Now, we can't understand the love of God as his attribute. And remember I said, out of all the usages of the term God loves or the love of God, only one of them is not. And that God is love is the attribute of God. The other day, Julie and I were got into this conversation and uh, I love this conversation that we had. It had to do with love. What is love? How is love expressed? Well, amongst human beings, there are many different ways in which love can be understood between one person and another. And we talked about the various ways in which love can be conveyed. Like you give something up for somebody that you love. You protect somebody that you love. But all of those things... And every time that you say that you love someone, you always have to have an object for your love. In other words, you address your action or your mental attitude towards somebody else, and that is love. If we put it in grammatical terms, we are looking at one of these sentences 
that has a subject, a verb, and a direct object. You're the subject, in other words, you produce the action, which is loving, and then there's another person over there who is your valentine. That's the person that you love. Well, God isn't like that. God does it very hard for us to understand. And because it's hard for us to understand, we can't believe how it is that God could bless us. Well, that's because in himself, he is love. And he does things that are beyond our comprehension. And so he allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And the only way that that can happen is because Christ went to the cross. Because you see, the justice of God is that watchdog that will not let God do anything that would compromise his character. And he is never going to show any favor or any favoritism to a sinner because that would immediately detract godliness or deity from him and he would no longer be God. And so the only way that we could ever enjoy sunshine, the only way that we could ever enjoy the warmth of somebody who loves us is because God is love. That is his character. But the mechanism to make that work is the justice of God. And that is what I want to get across to you as far as these three uh, chapters are concerned. And so in verse uh, 5 of chapter 3 it says, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, says he. I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? And so now here we have this question about wrath. How can God, we looked at the righteousness of God and how the righteousness of God is revealed. And one of the ways in which it's revealed is the wrath of God. So that the wrath of God reveals his righteousness. So we as human beings, because we have human terms, we have, how can a loving God send his creatures to the lake of fire? How can he? It's because Christ went to the cross and they rejected Christ. And that is what becomes the issue in the gospel. What are you going to do with Christ? Not what sins have you committed or what sins have you deleted from your life. It is, what are you going to do with Christ? So, I believe in Christ as my personal Savior. How am I doing for time here? 23 after. Okay. I believe in Christ as my personal Savior. The Bible says that when I believe that the righteousness of God is imputed to my account. Now we'll go over this again next week. And because the righteousness of God has been imputed to my account then that transaction is reviewed by the essence of God. So, first it's checked by the sovereignty of God. Is it God's will? The answer is yes. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? Uh, it's reviewed by the eternal life of God. Is the result of this righteousness give me eternal life? The answer is yes. Uh, it's reviewed by the love of God. Is God now eligible to give me blessings? The answer is yes, because righteousness has been given to me and justice has approved it. Is the omnipotence, the omniscience, the omnipresence of God, all of those are satisfied by the same uh, justice of God. Uh, will it ever change the immutability of God? No. Why? Because God has given me this. So you'll never lose your salvation You'll never be out of that phase where you are the target of God's love. He always targets his love toward you. And is this true or is this false? Is God trying to slip a, pass, uh, uh, a fast one past you or not? Well, obviously not. So the justice of God approves the righteousness of God. When I believed in Christ, he gave me his righteousness, his perfect righteousness, the justice of God reviews it and says, I approve it, 
you're now eligible to be blessed. Okay. That is what is known as justification. Now, an easy definition of justification is God sees me as if I never sinned. God sees me as if I never sinned. And that is different than God forgave me my sins. It's true that God separates our sins as far as the east is from the west, but when he looks at me now, he looks at me and he sees me through Christ. Christ is perfect, therefore I am perfect. That's justification. Okay. And so there is a vast difference between just being forgiven and being justified. Being forgiven is good, but being justified is much better. And when God does something, He always does something way beyond excellent. More than we could possibly ask or think. So, let me get past these guys. Let me uh, tell you about the Dreyfus affair. Have you... Richard Dreyfus? <laughs> Alfred Dreyfus. Have you guys heard of the Dreyfus affair? Just like the Thomas Crown affair? Eh, close. Close. <laughs> they did make a movie of it. Uh, Mike uh, Sams actually has the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that took place in the late 1800s. And it was a miscarriage of justice. Now, in introducing this Dreyfus affair, let me say this, and that is that we live in a country where... <clears throat> we have a constitution and the constitution, constitution guarantees that we are presumed innocent until proven guilty. This maybe doesn't seem like a very big blessing. But in other countries where that is not the law, they follow a different system or a different code of justice and it's called the Napoleonic Code of Justice. That is what they observe in countries like France. And that's where the Dreyfus Affair comes from. That means that you are accused of a crime and you have to prove that you're innocent or you're going to be punished. In our system, the prosecutor has to prove that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or you continue to be innocent. Or I shouldn't say innocent, but not guilty. So, if you uh, go to trial for some particular uh, crime, you are presumed to be innocent until the prosecutor can prove your guilt beyond a, a reasonable doubt. That isn't the case in France. It's not the case in Mexico. It's not the case in a lot of countries. In a lot of these countries, when somebody points the finger at you, you are guilty. You have to prove that you are innocent. And so this is the case of Alfred Dreyfus. Somebody pointed the finger at him, and he was innocent, but he couldn't prove his innocence. He finally was able to prove his innocence, and they said, okay, we forgive you. And he says, hey, I want more than forgiveness. I want you to say that I was never guilty. And that is the Dreyfus affair. It made world news when it took place because of the, the uh, high standard that uh, was overlooked by the French judicial system and because uh, the United States had grown to ascendancy and made such a big deal out of our uh, first ten amendments. So let's begin with, uh, with this one. Number one, worn by the Spanish military attaché while Carlos, the French intelligence services headed by Colonel Sandher have been carefully watching secret correspondence between the German and Italian military attachés. Maximilian von 
Schwarzkopen, and Alessandro Panizardi, <clears throat> Germany and Italy are at the time allied with Austria in a military union, which is known as the Triple Alliance, that was hostile to France. Number two, August the 15th of 1895. Estarzi receives payment by Schwarzkopen for delivering classified mobilization documents. So, let me jump ahead of everything. This Esther Hazy or Esther Hazy is the real culprit. He's the real bad guy. He is the guilty guy. He is receiving payment from the German Schwarzenkoppen for delivering classified military information. And there was a lot. A lot of it had to do with the way that cannons were being manufactured and how if you made it with the right kind of steel and you had the right kind of ammunition, they wouldn't blow up and they would hit their target. And so this was a big thing at the end of the uh, 1800s. Big military secret. So this is our guy here. Okay, on October the 15th in 1894, uh, after there was some handwritten, after some testimony by handwriting experts, but still lacking incriminating evidence, General Mercier, along with the heads of the general staff, General de Boisterf and his deputy in uh, charge of intelligence, General Gonzi, are now convinced that Dreyfus has been privy to the information leaked to the Germans in order to obtain an irrefutable handwriting sample. Uh, Commandant du Paty de Camp, the Clam, placed in charge of the investigation, calls Dreyfus and feigns to dictate him a letter based on the word, wording of the Bordereau. Okay, now I need to explain a couple of things here. His name is Mr. Clam Patty. Do Patty the Clam. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> they found this piece of paper that you see on the screen, and even though there wasn't Dreyfus's name on it, Dreyfus was accused of passing this paper on to the Germans, which is where the information was. So they got a handwriting expert to identify who was the Rothus. As it turns out, like 25 or 30 years later, an accountant who now lived in Argentina just happened to read a newspaper and this paper or this uh, note was pictured in the uh, in the paper newspaper and he says well I know that handwriting he's one of my clients so it was his information that led to the arrest of the proper guy but it was like 20 or 25 years later okay so they call in these uh, handwriting experts to take a look at this and this Paper is called the Bordereau. That's the title of this little document here. And our guy, Alfred Dreyfus, is pictured on either the left and the right. Since the two doc, oh, I forgot to mention that uh, <clears throat> when he was called in, the uh, commandant uh, asked him to take uh, a dictated letter so that they could compare the handwriting. And, uh, and it was a feigned letter. In other words, there was no such letter. They just did it to get his, his handwriting. It's kind of what they do today, you know, when cops want to get somebody's DNA. So they go to ask him a bunch of questions that he won't give his DNA because, you know, he says, you need a warrant for this. And so they keep asking him questions and asking him questions. And then pretty soon he gets thirsty. Then they say, can we get you a cup of coffee? And then once he starts to sip from the cup, they can look at the cup and get his saliva and whatnot. You just pour it in. Don't look. Right. I mean, that would that would be the way to do it. But then his hands are on it. See. So there's lots of things that cops do, and this is what they did back then. They pretended to be dictating a letter. <clears throat> in uh, the 13th of January in 1895, there was a uh, 
picture and an article in uh, in a magazine called Petit Journal, and uh, the uh, the title was The Traitor, and it shows the degradation of Alfred Dreyfus on the 5th of January, 1895. Okay, let me show you what is so interesting about this. A degradation is not just a sentence from a court. It means that you are stripped of your rank and that you are publicly humiliated. And so here on the, bring the, uh, here is Dreyfus and you can see all his patches are torn or down here on the ground. And the person who's doing the degrading has taken his saber and he breaks it over his knee. That means he no longer has any command in the French army. Now Dreyfus just happened to be one of the best generals that France ever had. The other problem that he had, apart from being good, and therefore being the object of jealousy, was that he was Jewish. And there are certain Frenchmen that just hated the Jews. He was also born in a place called Alsace, or Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine is a little chunk of land that exists between France and Germany. And France and Germany have been fighting over this little piece of land forever. They fight over this piece of land because it's rich in a lot of things, but primarily coal. So this is where they get fuel. And so when Germany had it, then the people who lived in Alsace were Germans. When France had it, then the people were French. Well, this guy just happened to be born in Alsace when the Germans had it. But he was really French. So his accuser said, He's Jewish, and he's actually German. And that is why he is passing secrets on to the Germans. So they convicted him, and then they degraded him. And this is a picture that appeared in uh, uh, Le Petit Journal. December 31st of 1894, Dreyfus's petition for appeal is rejected. He says, hey, I was convicted, but I want to appeal this trial. And they rejected his appeal. January the 5th of 1895, in other words, a few weeks later, the sentence was carried out. The degradation takes place in public in the courtyard of the École Militaire, which is the military school. A warrant officer strips him of his badges, his buttons, and then draws Dreyfus's sword from its scabbard and snaps it across his knee. During the ordeal, since patriots along with an anti-Semitic mob unleash shouts of anger at the traitor, who continues to maintain that they are punishing the wrong man. <coughs> Later, a second trial was granted, but Dreyfus was reconvicted. And here Dreyfus is uh, trying to prove his innocence, but uh, he failed in doing that, so he was convicted a second time. And yet he was innocent. January the 5th, in uh, January the 5th of 1895, the sentence is carried out, the degradation takes place, uh, and we just read that a few minutes ago. Uh, he continues to say that they are punishing the wrong man. On April 13th of 1895, Dreyfus is transferred to Devil's Island, where he will be placed in solitary confinement. Now, you probably have never heard of Devil's Island, but a hundred years ago, oh, yeah. it was rated as one of the top ten hardest prisons in human yeah, history. They did, they did movie about it. Yeah. It was a famous prison of the 19th and 20th century. It operated several locations in French Guiana. This is where the Jim Jones people were. <clears throat> okay, here's a map of South America. And I'll get the cursor going here. And you can see where Guiana is. You have French Guiana. And then over, way over to the side you have Dutch Guiana. And so this area down in here is the Guianas. Out of the Guianas, there is a small section of 
kind of like the Outer Banks in the Carolinas. And that's where these islands are. And uh, here they are. There is uh, Devil's Island, Ile du Diable, uh, the Royal, and the St. Joseph, the Isle of St. Joseph. So there are these three islands that are right on the outer coast of French Guiana. Now, French Guiana for many years was known as the Green Hell. And that's because once you go into the jungle, you can't hardly survive. It's only what uh, it's only like about 70 to 100 miles at its widest, and people die going from one place to the other. They just can't can't do it. It is a terrible place. But these guys weren't in the jungle part; they were in the island part. And the French had that pretty well built up. There was a French society there, and uh, and so forth. But they were the hardest of uh, of those prisons. Considered at that time, 1852 to 1953, as being one of the ten hardest prisons in human history, the most famous uh, such prisoner was Captain Alfred Dreyfus. So the most famous prisoner of that prison was our guy. The second most famous prisoners were Steve McLean yeah. and Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. If you've seen the movie Papillon, that is what, well, that's the islands. Of course, it took place many years later. Butterfly? <gasps> yeah, Papillon means butterfly, and that's what he, what Papillon had tattooed on his chest. Okay. So, if you see the movie, you will see how difficult it would be to get away from those islands. And uh, nobody ever got away. In fact, uh, uh, they would say that uh, anybody who died, or who, who tried to escape and was killed, that they would take the body and throw it over the cliff into the ocean, and that the sharks are so used to being fed that they just never left that area. <clears throat> September the 3rd, 19, 1898, the Minister of War, Cavignac, resigns, and his statement is posted throughout France. He resigns because information has come forward that our guy is actually innocent. Um, Lucy Dreyfus, who was the wife of Alfred, petitions once more the Chamber of Deputies requesting a retrial for her husband. So this would be the third trial. On the uh, 30th, 1898, after, witnesses, after a witness confesses to his perjury, he slits his own throat with a razor at the military prison at Mont, uh, Mont Valerien. Two generals request to be relieved of their posts. What perjury was this? He said that, that Alfred Dreyfus had written that note. Oh. And uh, he was... Well, didn't he write it and the general dictate it to him and have him write it? No, he never wrote it. Oh, he never did? No, he wrote something else. Oh, I see. So uh, the guy who said that's definitely his handwriting knew at the time that it wasn't. So it was a show trial. It was a French trial. <laughs> Are French trials always show trials? <laughs> just well, well, just, just like just China. <laughs> something like that. The real the real traitor was Esther Hazy. He flees to Belgium, and then from there he goes to England. <sighs> he becomes a private detective. <laughs> on the 26th of September, 1898, citing new evidence, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Brisson submits the Dreyfus file to the Court of Cassation requesting a pretrial or a retrial. On October 29th, in other words, about a month later, the possibility of a retrial is finally Granted. I, I hope your dates are wrong there, because that's a long time to wait. <laughs> what? A month? A year. A hundred years. A hundred years. A hundred years. A hundred years. Oh, yeah, my dates are... I, I know I corrected that. <laughs> I know I corrected that. Well, that, that prison obviously gives longevity. <laughs> yeah. Long life in prison. Good food. Yeah. Number 11, the Senate follows suit on the institution of a Supreme Court of Appeals. Uh, with all three chambers sitting jointly. So this now is a super duper trial. Third, 1899.
Court of Appeals overturns the verdict of 1894. The circumstances of the arrest, the trial of 1894, and the new facts which have since been established all indicate the innocence of Dreyfus. So now there's a mountain of evidence. By decree, Dreyfus is called before a new court-martial and remanded to Rene, which is another military prison. And remanded just means that he was incarcerated again. So he was transferred from one prison to another. A better one. Please. Yeah. June the 4th, 1899, Dreyfus is informed that his retrial has finally been granted. He leaves Devil's Island on June the 9th. September the 9th through the 19th of 1899. Despite the evidence of his innocence, the military court finds Dreyfus guilty of treason once again. Four times. This time with extenuating circumstances and condemns him to 10 years of detention. So that's another 10 years. They didn't want to admit they were, they were wrong. No, because they were covering up. Yeah. The French were so militaristic, yeah. the military cannot do anything wrong. Okay. And so the verdict causes a public uproar because everybody loved Dreyfus. He was an excellent soldier. He had proven himself excellent way before this. With full approval of the Wallendeck Rousseau cabinet, President Loubet signs Dreyfus's pardon. Okay? So what does pardon mean? It means, yes, you're guilty, but now I forgive you. Yeah. Okay. Against the advice of most of his supporters, the innocent officer, exhausted <coughs> after six years of solitary confinement. Okay, do you remember in the movie Papillon? Five years, and I mean, you, nobody hardly ever made it five years, but he made it six. I'm impressed he didn't kill himself. Exhausted after six years of solitary confinement, accepts the presidential grace with the proviso that he can continue to fight to prove his innocence. November the 26th, 1906, now the 19th, that's right. 1906, Dreyfus requests from the Minister of Justice a retrial of his René conviction. So why do you suppose that this innocent person did not want to be pardoned, but wanted to have the court publish its error and not just overturn his conviction? He wanted to prove that he was innocent all along. He wanted to be justified. Yeah. And that is what God does to us when we believe in Christ. <coughs> we don't deserve to be said to be innocent. We're not just pardoned. What the righteousness of God accepts, the justice of God approves. And so, and Abraham believed in the Lord and it was imputed to him as righteousness, immediately the justice of God comes and justifies the man. And that's what happens to you and to me when we believe in Christ. So, November the 26th, 1906, he requests uh, from the Prime Minister a retrial of that conviction. On the 12th of July, 1906, after a new inquiry, the Supreme Court of Appeals, with all three chambers sitting jointly, annuls the Rene verdict pronounces the rehabilitation of Dreyfus and proclaims his innocence. With back pay. <laughs> okay, and that's what their rehabilitation is. They reinstated him into the military and they gave him uh, the honor of upper rank. 1899, the release from prison. Dreyfus uh, pointedly remarked upon his release. He says, quote, the government of the Republic, which incidentally, France was known as the Republic in those days. And in this case, it was the Third Republic. There have been two republics previous to this. Just like Germany was known as the Reich, mm -hmm. France was known as the Republic. So when we talk about the Third Reich, we're talking about a, the Third administration of Germans. 
and the Republic, uh, in this case it was the third uh, administration of France. So the government of the Republic has given me back my freedom. It is nothing for me without my honor. And that is what justification does. It says, just as if I never sinned. So on the 20th of July, 1906, Alfred Dreyfus is made the Chevalier or the Chevalier of the Legion of Honor in the same courtyard of the Ecole Militaire where he had been degraded 11 years before. So this is a, an excellent illustration of justification. To the enthusiastic yells of long live Dreyfus, he proudly shouts back, no, gentlemen, no, I beg of you, long live France. Wow. So this is a picture of a true patriot. Yeah. Now, he wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew. But he understood that he had been wrong because they took away not only his innocence, but his, his, his honor. Yeah. And so he fought to get that honor back. Now, this is 1906. Let me show you one more picture. Alfred uh, Dreyfus dies in 1935 at the age of 74. Okay, what year is that? 1935. That is three years before uh, Germany invades Poland. Right? So World War II is on the verge of starting. And when Germany invades Poland, they herd all of the Jews into the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto, and then they start <coughs> um, putting them on, on trains and taking them to the death camps. Yeah. Okay. At least he didn't have to go through that. It, yeah, he didn't have to go through that. But it was his innocence that started a group, and I can't remember the name of the group, but it's something like the Jewish Justice League. The Jewish Justice League became the forefathers of the Zionists who then worked so hard at establishing the State of Israel. And, and all of that was owed to the fact that he was a Jew and part of the reason that they wanted to punish him so bad was because he was Jewish. And so <clears throat> Israel today owes a lot of its existence to this man here who was actually in France. Now, as a side note, France could have been a great client nation to God. And maybe it was at the very beginning of its kingdom with Charles Martel. But the French have always been licentious. And they have hated, and they kicked the Protestants out that were known as the Huguenots or the Huguenots. That's when France cut its own throat. So France has been, even though it's honored by everybody, a third-rate country. And so this is one thing that we don't want to do in our country. We don't want to go against Israel, and we want to keep the pivot healthy in our country. France didn't do that. So, anyway, I think that'll be all for tonight. We'll do another thing next time. Yeah, question. Just one question. Well, you say that God <coughs> looks at us through Christ and sees us as just as if we had never sinned. So, would that be fair to say that he looks at us, us the same way he looked at Adam before the fall? Better. Better than Adam. Oh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. There was a difference. Way better. There. Way better than Adam. Because we are in, in Christ. Because well, yeah, because now in the church age we are in Christ. Right. Adam may have been saved, but well, before he fell, he was a perfect being. Right. All right, but he wasn't in Christ. And if he would have died, and this is an if question, you know, these hypotheticals that don't exist, and so it's almost foolish to pursue them. But it's kind of interesting to follow one of some of these questions. You know what? What would be Adam's position if he were to have died in an unfallen state? Well, obviously, he's not going to fall, or he's not going to die because he hasn't fallen. 
But if he were, what would, but you and I have much more than that. Yeah. We sit at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the most exalted person in the universe because he sits at the right hand of God and we are his bride. So we are way above anything that Adam would have been. So the love of God could not keep Adam from sinning. So the quote-unquote salvation that Adam had didn't hold. Better question is what would Adam, what would have happened if Adam had grabbed Eve by the ear after she ate the apple and took her over to Christ? Look what she did. <laughs> then he'd have been guilty of judging. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of those hypotheticals, you know, especially when you start talking about the garden, what would have happened, and and all of this, you know. Uh, of course, since we don't know because the Bible doesn't reveal it to us, it makes for a lot of speculation. Yeah. And uh, I guess one of the greatest speculations uh, has to do, you know, with how many years they were in the garden before this event actually happened. And I like Bob's answer the best. Could have been a thousand or could have been ten thousand years. Yeah. Could have been even more than that. We just don't know. Yeah. But there are some people who say it happened the week after the creation of, of the woman. How do they know? I, I don't know. I, think, just, yeah, I think it would take a while for curiosity to set in somewhere down the line. I mean, you're brand new to this environment. Everything is all you're busy sampling different fruits and having fun, and you know. I think it would take a while before you got around to yeah. looking at the center tree. And I don't what? think Satan would have been patient enough to wait a thousand years. But why did the snake get by? Because it wasn't my fault. You know, <laughs> Satan made me do it. <laughs> well, that. I wondered. Um, theme said that I, I think it was theme that uh, the snake was really like. Uh, Eve's pet, and I wondered if he had anything that he was basing that on from like the, the Hebrew or anything? No. <laughs> no, there's nothing in the Hebrew that says that the snake was his pet or her pet. Okay. It says that the snake was more subtle than any That's of the right. beasts that were on the field. So, what you can conclude from that safely is that Man was attacked through the agency of the snake, but the attack was satanic. See. So it wouldn't have gone through just any animal. There was a reason that one was chosen. Yeah, the reason was that it was more subtle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And subtle means that it was more intelligent. What does that mean? It means that, for instance, I don't know who your friends are, but I can tell you that any friend of yours is going to be somebody who has common interests with you. And that's the way it was in the garden. Who did, who did she have common interests with? Well, there was Adam. Adam. And there was the Lord Jesus Christ who would come every night. But, you know, let's face it, it's a little boring. Right? And so, here was an animal that could interact. Satan, Satan may have taken years to cultivate a relationship with the snake. <laughs> and that, and that's a part that we don't know. We don't know how it is that Satan manipulated the serpent. What kind of mindset must Eve have been in that her first reaction was, the holy crap, a talking snake! <laughs> well, it was, it was an easy mindset because snakes weren't dangerous at that time. And he didn't. He wasn't slithering on his belly. That was part of the. Curse. It's, it's not. It's not the danger part. It's the talking part. How do you know they didn't talk? <laughs> How do you know all the animals didn't talk? Well, it gives no indication one way or the other. Okay. Yeah, doesn't give an indication. It does say that after they fell, that all of creation you know, fell to be under them. You know, so horses. So maybe everybody talked before them. Horses could be taught to do, you know, yes and no with their feet and count well, with their feet. So maybe those horses. They, no, they, can, they can only be taught to, to follow cues. They're yeah, not thinking. Yeah. They've proven that one. Along, mm -hmm. along the very same lines is this question. Why was the serpent cursed? Yeah. If the Satan was behind it, that's the... It had to have had some free will because you can't punish what doesn't have free will. Well, it star he started the curse of the whole... whole 
Earth. Okay, now, I mean, that, this is a question, right? Why was the serpent cursed? If animals are not free moral agents like human beings, right. what law of God did the serpent transgress? That's a good question. See, I mean, you're at, you ask a question, but you opened a big door here. <laughs> you opened a big door. And the door is, what business did God have judging this serpent? I mean, what did the serpent do? Okay. It had to have so, had free will of some sort. Not necessarily. What do you need to have free will? Intelligence. You need to have intelligence. You can't discriminate between this and that. Said so it was more, more subtle. Well, that means it had to have intelligence. It had the more intelligence than anything else. Yeah. It had to be So, what good did this curse do? It got rid of intelligence in all the rest of the animals. Maybe. Well, maybe the snake had legs and had arthritis, so it was really happening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, that the cursing of the serpent actually is a demonstration that God cursed nature. Yeah. And that curse is that God exists. Here and, is the evidence. And it was not any fault of nature's for Adam, what Adam done. Okay, and so that shows the ripple effect of the impact that sin has on all of its right. surroundings. Yeah, the, the earth had to be cursed because we could not have had a sinful man or human race brought up in a perfect environment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that would even be further, you know how like the, the rich have a harder time, mm -hmm. you know, so because they have everything. You know, so if the earth was perfect, man wouldn't want to look to God. Mm -hmm. One of the principles I follow in my thinking is that every single thing that God does has more than one reason for it. That it's like if, if we're here at a specific restaurant at a specific time to meet out of the blue a specific person and talk to them about salvation, that has other things going on too, such as maybe the person in the next booth overhears it, maybe the server was pleased by the positive attitude we had and went on to be nice to her kid at home which helped them at school. There's ripples of everything. It's never just one thing. We didn't tell you about the exciting time we had leaving church.